This presentation is on chapter 6 of Why Evolution is True. The topic is how sex drives evolution and how sexual selection can be used as a vehicle to drive speciation um, and encourage survival among the population. So let's get into it. What is sexual selection? Um, definition of it is natural selection arising through preference by one sex for certain characteristics in individuals of the other sex. That's great, we can all read definitions, but what exactly does that mean? Um, sexual selection is basically one sex of a species picking out either physical traits, um, competitive traits, or uh, chemical traits in the other sex to decide on who they're going to mate with, uh, basically enabling some members of that population to successfully mate and procreate their genes, and other ones uh, to be cut out of the gene pool, which can lead to a couple different things. Um, first of all, it can promote good things and also promotes uh, variability among the population, and it can also exclude bad things. So sickly or weak members of the population might not get the chance to mate if they're sexually selected against, while strong members of that population um, will have more of a chance to, to mate. So, looking at um, physical characteristics, like how would this make for an evolutionary advantage? Um, for instance, the peacock has to regrow this, this elaborate tail feather scheme every year. It's a lot of uh, metabolic waste. Um, it attracts a lot of attention, makes it hard to fly. Um, it seems like this might not be so good for the peacock. In addition to that, we see this in the Irish elk. Uh, its antlers are massive. They have to be grown every year. It's the same thing. Big metabolic load on the organism. Uh, the antlers can weigh up to nine pounds and a skull on average weighs five pounds. So it's cumbersome, uh, wasted energy just carrying these things around and uh, really seems like it, it's not going to be so good for it from an evolutionary standpoint. In addition to that, uh, we see this in some frogs. Frogs sing at night to attract mates, but they're also giving away their location um, to predators. So they're really making themselves uh, culprit for predation and uh, putting a spotlight on themselves to be eaten, more or less. Um, lastly, you see uh, the collared lizard is a good example. Some experiments have been done on it. Uh, Bradley colored um, to attract females, but also it's out in the open, so you're going to attract birds and everything. Uh, so there's an experiment done uh, where they painted clay rocks uh, with the same bright colorings as these lizard and they paid in some of the rocks with the dull colorings like the females just to see the variation of how many of these got attacked by birds uh, when they were colored as opposed to uncolored. So you have the dimorphism in the species, but it's really hurting one side of it. And what they found is that in 35 out of 40, the colored ones, it showed bite marks. So predators were attracted to them and the vast majority of them would have been eaten. And as far as the green, the, sorry, the gray uh, clay rocks that they made, zero out of 40 of them were bitten. So really having that bright coloring, again, doesn't seem to be much of an advantage to this. So uh, let's look at what sexual dimorphisms are. Uh, they're traits that differ between males and females of a species, such as tails, uh, color, and song. So again, we saw in the lizard, you have color differentiation. Uh, in the peacocks, obviously, you have these elaborate tails. Um, and in frogs, you see different songs being sung, where the females are going to be quiet and the males are singing. Um, and this picture just shows the, the huge difference between uh, male and female peacocks. You just kind of get an idea of how much energy is going into um, making these structures. So this raises a question. Why would a species evolve um, traits that harm the survival of one sex? Um, and the answer is pretty simple. The trade-off between reproductive success and the organism's survival is worth it. So if you're able to attract a mate and spread your genes and you can survive, uh, meaning your species survives, so you have reproductive success, uh, it's less important than that individual surviving. So from that individual, you're going to get a multitude of new individuals, and that ratio is going to outweigh the downside to it. So in that sense, this seems to make sense. 
So there's two forms of sexual selection. Uh, the first one is direct competition, and the second one is female choosiness. And we'll kind of go through both of those, what they are. So in direct competition, we see this a lot among male, um, male gender, a lot of species. In this picture, there's elephant seals where they fight on the beach it's before the females even arrive. And uh, they will literally paddle for, uh, for mating rights. Um, we see this also in birds that guard their territory after mating. So once they mate with a female, uh, males will directly compete to keep that female only impregnated by the one male, and he, he will protect his territory fiercely from other males coming in. We also see this in insects, too, but in a slightly different way, where insects will physically block any uh, entrance site to the female. So after um, inseminating the female, they will literally just physically block that entrance, so other ones can't get in there. So the second one we said is female choosiness. Uh, females can also just be picky on what males they mate with. There's a ton of males, not as many females. Um, so again, we see uh, this in peacocks, which is part of why they have these big elaborate displays. And they did a couple tests, and they found that the eye spots on the peacock tails usually equate to more matings. And experimentally, they tried to prove this. So they took males with tons of eye spots, and they saw the ratio of females that they successfully made it with. And they took the same males and they covered those eye spots with paint. And what they found is that there's a direct correlation to the number of eye spots and the successful matings. And when they covered those eye spots, in fact, the males were not able to mate. Uh, the females chose against them. Another example of this, um, oops. Another example of this uh, is the African tailed widow bird, and these guys have ridiculously long tails. It doesn't seem to make sense. It makes flying hard. They can't get around very well. Uh, they're really cumbersome and slow. Predators are going to get them, but the females pick the males with the longer tails. And again, um, they ran experiments on this where they gave males artificially long tails up to uh, 20 centimeters, and the females always chose them. And when they clipped the males' tails, made them shorter, they were selective against. So we see this over and over. Um, female choosiness is really just based on how elaborate the display is by the So again, this raises a question. Why do females get to choose what males must fight for them? Why do females even bother to choose at all? And on top of that, why do organisms even have sex? Because when you have sex, uh, any organisms that's reproducing sexually has to make gametes. So you have an egg and a sperm. And because of that, they've got to sacrifice 50% of their genetic info uh, to the next generation when compared to an organism such as like a bacteria uh, that reproduces asexually and gets 100% of its um, genetic info. Those. So it seems like that could be a, um, a disadvantage because you're giving up half of your stuff that you want to you want to. But the answer to this is that recombination um, due to sexual reproduction causes more variation in a population and it gives the group a better chance of survival with environmental changes. Uh, sexual selection can also purge out bad genes from a population, like I said earlier. So when you're giving up 50%, you're also gaining 50%. And so hopefully, in some of those combinations, you'll be getting the best of both worlds. So if the grass is greener on both sides, why not just take a little bit of the grass from each and combine them, right? Also, if you have a, a sick gene or a gene that tends to make animals weak, sexually selecting against that is going to quickly get rid of that in a population. And as a whole, they're going to be a lot more successful. Um, so in addition to that, we tend to see asymmetry in sexual selection, even at like a molecular level. For instance, the egg is massive. Tons of resources go into it. Um, it contains you know, organelles, all the different chemicals in the cytoplasm. There's a lot to it. And then you have the sperm, which is basically just a tail some ATP and some genetic info. It's also much smaller. It's really cheap to make sperm. It's really expensive to make the eggs. Um, so why do, we, why do we see that? So why do we see that? Uh, and a lot of it just comes down to how much energy is being spent on these things. So females, for instance, are going to have to put a lot more energy into rearing their young. Uh, they're going to have to generally uh, provide for the uh, for the egg, they're going to have to nourish it, they're going to have to give birth to it, give parental care, while males really just donate some sperm and uh, move off. So males have a 
really a little bit to lose by mating with a weak female. Just a bit of time, and they can mate again. Females have a lot more to lose and have to be picky with their mates, uh, which leads to males competing for females, even down at the molecular level. Um, so while we see males for these big exotic displays, they're also going to have cheap uh, gametes. While females are saving their energy, not producing these displays, but they're putting a lot of energy into the gamete. Moving on, what about monogamy? Um, how do we explain that among animals? Uh, you'd expect uh, you expect that not to exist, right? Because it makes sense to try to spread your genes around as much as you can for as much variation as possible. And in fact, that's really what we tend to see. Um, maybe socially some birds are monogamous, um, but when it comes time to mating season, uh, they're not. Uh, they're pretty promiscuous, and they tend to really mix the gene pool a lot. There are, of course, exceptions. Um, for instance, penguins are the classic exception. But you would think that if, uh, if monogamy holds true, and they're not really competing, they get a mate and they stick with them for life, that you wouldn't really see the same level of sexual dimorphism as you would in other species. And with uh, organisms like the penguin, that's exactly what you see. They're pretty much uniform and... Uh, there is no reason for the energy spent for the dimorphism, and that's not what we see. So uh, that holds true with the whole theory. So occasionally the dimorphism will switch gender, and the females are the ones competing for the males. Um, we see this in seahorses, where male seahorses carry the young and take longer to gestate uh, than it does for a female to produce an egg. So see so a complete switch and the dimorphism, where the females are the big elaborate ones, and the, male, and the males are pretty much the smaller, uh, less likely to be eaten ones. Um, and females must end up competing for a non-pregnant male, and they tend to be the ones that are brightly colored and put on the displays. Uh, lastly, we have a thing called the sensory bias models. Uh, the models assume that evolution of sexual dimorphism is driven simply by pre-existing biases in a female's nervous system. And those biases could be the byproduct of natural selection for some function, other than finding mates, like finding foods. So, for instance, uh, a female bird likes red because the color of her favorite berry is red. A mutant male pops up, and he's got a red spot, and she's going to end up liking him just because of her pre-existing preference. Um, we don't really know what exactly drives these, but we do see them in nature. Um, and we can also test it. So, for instance... Uh, their experiments run on, on some birds with head plumes, where females tend to like males with bigger head plumes. And they took a look at males with artificially large ones and males where they cut those off. And again, uh, the plumes would tend to be colors of like foods they like or something like that. And what we saw is in fact that when you got rid of the plumage, uh, those ones were unsuccessful in mating. They, the females just didn't like them. They were selected against and again, why they do this is not exactly clear, uh, but there is some correlation to like uh, colors that they prefer and things like that having to do with food. So in closing, uh, again, we want to see like how does sex drive evolution? And dimorphisms drive several mechanisms of evolution with the purpose of promoting desirable genes and purging bad genes from a population. So all in all, uh, it just leads to more genetic variation. The trade-off of procreating is worth... Um, the lack of survival, and you see these things just being propagated over time and getting more and more elaborate just because those are the ones who are selected for, and as they become more attractive to the female or male, depending on the species, we see these, this big range in physical appearance uh, between sexes. Thank you.